All right, so if we were to look back at um, a kind of recent history and a topic that's been prominent for a while, even prior to this series, is that of suffering. You know, we've talked a lot about that. And where I want to go the next, we'll probably go another two weeks on this particular uh, series, The Afflicted Path. Um, and where I want to go is beginning to take that into a practical sense of what does suffering look like for the Christian in the 21st century church in North America? Because I think that's, that's kind of an important place to go. What role does that have to play? And what does that actually look like? But before, um, you know, before actually getting there, I think it's important to, I think it's important to identify, okay, if we can get to the point where we say, I'm okay with the fact that God wants me to suffer. If we can get there and say, okay, God wants me to suffer for some reason, um, and okay, I, I accept that, that's part of the Christian experience. If we can accept that, I think that leads to this next question that we need to address first before moving on, and that's why. You know, why does God actually require Christians to suffer? It must be a purpose. So what is the actual why behind it? And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. And I think we've done, um, hopefully, what we've established so far, that suffering is indeed required. Whatever that looks like, um, you know, whatever that means, it seems that Christ requires suffering. That he said, part of his example is that he suffered and that we are ident to identify with that suffering. And if... You know, if nothing else affirms that truth, I think we could look to the most common symbol that is associated with Christianity, and that's the cross. Right? This symbol, the cross itself, is a symbol of suffering. We may look at it as just Christ's suffering, but the cross itself is a symbol of suffering. Right? And they under, would have understood that very well in their day. Uh, you know, when Christ says, take up your cross, you know, of course... They didn't have the picture at that time of him going to the cross. They just had the picture of that was a common means of death. They knew if you're picking up your cross, then he's, it's a call to suffering. Right? So that was known. It's this picture of suffering that ultimately, if you're picking up a cross, it's leading to your death. That was the only scenario in which carrying a cross uh, would lead to. It's going to lead to ultimately your death. So they would have known when saying, take up your cross and follow me, they would have known that he was saying, you know, this is going to lead, following me is going to ultimately lead to your death. And I think he's probably talking about a bit more than just physical death, even though in his case, in many of the disciples' case, it did lead to their physical death. Um, there is something more pictured there than just physical death. So the question is, again, why is suffering required? And I think that the answer is found, or I would say that I know that the answer is found as we actually defined, define the salvation that Christ provides for us. And so if we would look first at the most common concept of salvation, at least how I think it is typically understood by, by many in the church, essentially reduces salvation to a get-out-of-hell-free card. Right? We look at it, here's the, uh, it's a means to an end. If I want to get out of hell... I want to come to Christ, I want to be saved, so that if I have one of two eternal destinies in hand, one sounds better than the other. And so it kind of, I think, boils down to that oftentimes, that Christ came to deliver us from the suffering of hell. You know, deliverance, you know, deliverance from the lake of fire, or the second death as it's called, that is certainly uh, a component of the salvation Christ provides. There's no question that's, that's a component of it. But I don't think that that comes close to defining the true nature of salvation. You know, I don't think salvation is just that he saves us from suffering in hell. And of course, I will attempt to substantiate that with Scripture. So if you want to open up your Bibles or Bible apps, uh, we're going to start in 1 John chapter 3 tonight. We're going to read first, uh, starting at verses 8, uh, verses 8 and 9. It says there that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice, practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So there John makes clear that the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. 
right? That goes beyond just get out of hell free. It's actually to destroy the work that the devil is doing in this world. If you go back a few verses, uh, verses 5 and 6 of that same chapter, it says there that you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Challenging statement. Uh, jump with me quickly to Luke chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. It says there that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so these are some purposes for salvation that go far beyond, again, the get out of hell free card. You know, it's to proclaim liberty to the, to the captives, it's to destroy the, the works of the devil. There's, there's all these things that are listed there. And I think where that leads, ultimately, if we look at what true salvation is, is that Christ came to set us free from our bondage to sin. Right? Not just that he came to forgive us of our sin, because he does that, but it's to actually set us free from the bondage that we experience to sin. And so this is where I would go back quickly to a topic we spent a lot of time in uh, in the fall, and that is this journey that Israel experienced, coming out of Egypt, going to the Promised Land, and the parable that there is in that for us in our understanding. Because what we talked about at the time is that Israel's coming out of Egypt is, or even before that, Israel being in captivity in Egypt is a type and shadow of the bondage that we all experience. Right? It's a, we all experience the type of bondage that Israel experienced. Because we know, if we go right back to Genesis, that everyone who is born of Adam enters the world a slave to sin. Right? Because of Adam's sin, we are all, therefore, sinners. Right? So if you are born into this world, you are born into sin. Just like if you were born into Israel at that time, you were born into captivity. That was just a reality for them. If you're born and you're an Israelite, you're captive. You're a slave to Pharaoh in this case. Right? It's the same thing for us. If we're born into this world that has sin, we are born into the bondage of sin. And the reality is that unless God then had sent a Savior, we would all remain in bondage to sin today. You know, if we go back to the example, we'd all still be in Egypt. Right? We would have no hope of ever escaping from Egypt. So Christ ultimately came to set captives free. So let's jump now to Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 14 to 15 and then 17 to 25. So this is Paul saying that, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And so if you can track with that as it can be a bit of a tongue twister of I don't do what I want to do, I do what I don't want, all this raging that Paul is going on, the frustration you can sense, I think, in his words. He makes clear in the end 
that thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, that he came to set him free from that reality. And so I think what we would take away from that is that Christ's salvation is primarily focused on delivering us from sin's rule over our lives. You know, more than just, again, forgiveness, more than I want to change your destiny from this to the other thing, is to actually deliver us from the power that sin has, the power that keeps us in bondage. And the reality is that prior to Christ, it was impossible to break free. Right? We see that with the example in Egypt as well, that prior to the blood of the, of the Passover lamb on the doorposts, it was impossible for the people of Israel to leave Egypt. But through that act, finally, Pharaoh loses his grip on them. Finally, he loses his grip, he allows Israel to go, and God leads them out of that bondage. But the reality, again, for us, as we talked about, that because of Adam, a law was introduced into the world. Paul talked about that in the previous chapter in Romans 6, verse 23, he says that the wages of sin is death. So that law was introduced. Ezekiel 18.4 adds to that, saying that the soul who sins shall die. So it's the same idea. Sin, sin, sin leads to death. If the, you sin, you're going to die. So that's an inescapable law that's been introduced through Adam. That sin is going to lead to death. That you cannot escape that. Romans 5.12 says that, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So again, Adam brings us into this captivity that we experience to sin. So it is through Adam that we all became subject to the law of sin and death. So that's the inescapable law that we are all captive to. So if we go back again to, to Egypt, to that example, we have Pharaoh and Egypt as a whole standing as a, a type of the mastery that sin has over all of mankind. Right? That is the role that Egypt is playing. That is the role that Pharaoh is playing when he, will ref he refuses time and time again to let the people of Israel go. You know, Pharaoh would not let the captives free. Instead, he demands that they spend their lives basically in service to him. You know, okay, yeah, sure, you have these, these plagues. That's an inconvenience. You still have to stay. You still have to serve me. And so that would have been the way that they remained forevermore, as it did. I mean, they were in captivity for hundreds of years. But God decided to intervene, and he made a way for them to be free. And so again, to, to recap, if death leads to the consequence of sin, you know, that's a law that cannot be denied. Again, the wages of sin is death. But God would permit... What we see throughout the Old Testament, and this is, a lot of this is in Leviticus, that book that you got to and didn't read. A lot of this, what we see there is this idea of you can have one creature, the soul of one creature can be the substitution for the soul of another creature. We see that first all the way back in Genesis. So God established this law. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament sacrifices as well, right? With the, with the bulls, with the... Um, the different birds and, and the lambs, with all these different animals that if you went and you sacrificed them, their soul could serve as a replacement for the soul of the man or the woman that was sacrificed them. But it was also important that the animals had to be slain and their blood poured out. Because what we're told as well in Leviticus is that the soul is in the blood. Right? So it's important for that blood to be spilled because the soul of a person, that soul that needs to be accounted for, is contained within the blood. And so God decided that he would accept the souls of animals ex in exchange for the souls of men and women. So let's take that rule then and apply it again back to Israel's bondage in Egypt. You know, as I said already, that they could not be released from bondage until the blood of the Passover lamb was applied to those doorposts. You know, until the blood of the Passover lamb had been shed, they were still captive. But as soon as that Passover lamb, blood has been shed, God took that as a substitution 
that they would let those people be free. So we can only escape from bondage to sin through death. There's no other way to escape it. Death has to be required. And as we bring this back into our reality, the Passover lamb died for them just as Christ died for us. You know, we talked about last week that Christ was our Passover, or is our Passover lamb. You know, his death becomes our death. And so having died with Christ, sin or, or Pharaoh no longer has any power over us, no longer has any control over our lives. And so then, if I would just summarize that up, that's the salvation that Christ purchased for us. Right? That's the context in which hopefully we can picture that tonight. That is the salvation that he purchased for us, but that then leads us back to the original question of why must I then suffer? You know, we've, been, we've experienced this salvation. We've come out of Egypt, as it were. But why do I need to now suffer? Why is that a requirement God has for each of us? And we could take this to you know, lots of other questions of, you know, if the power of sin has been broken over my life, why do I still need to carry a cross? You know, wasn't, and this is the, the next most popular follow-up question, is wasn't the cross of Christ sufficient? Are we saying that in the need to suffer, that Christ didn't do everything that he was supposed to do on the cross, or do we need to add to that in some way? Was that not sufficient for our lives? And so those are all, I mean, those are all fair questions. Those are all good questions. And those are questions that we're going to hope to at least talk about a little bit in the next few minutes. And so what Scripture teaches us is that in Christ, we become new creatures. Right? Where there was death previously, now there is life. You know, that spirit that was dead, that relationship that was dead, is now being made alive. So in other words, a spiritual being now has been conceived. Right? There was no spiritual component to us before. We had no means by which to communicate with God, but now a spiritual being has been conceived, essentially. From the moment that we receive the seed of Christ in our lives, we begin to grow, we begin to mature, we begin to advance in our conformity to the image of Christ. That's, that's that process. As, as Christ comes into our life, as that seed of Christ comes into our life, we begin to to grow. That seed begins to nurture in our lives. So let's look at this as an, as an example, though, uh, tying back to Adam again. All right, we know that we are Adam's seed. All right, therefore, because of that, because we all descend from Adam, we are like him. You know, we are sinners just like he was. And so until we re receive Christ's seed, there is no hope for us to, to learn any other way of life. But if we have Adam's seed and we are like him, when we receive Christ's seed, we begin to become like him. The problem is, of course, we've had a lifetime of experience of how to follow the other path. We have a lifetime of experience of responding to Adam's seed within us. And it takes time to learn to respond to that new seed that has been planted within us. And we need to learn to respond to Christ. Because as Paul is taught, or yeah, as Paul is talking about in Romans 7, that's a constant battle. Right? He has this new life within him, and yet his members, his body, naturally defaults to this other way of life, this other way that has become natural to him and become natural to mankind. And so that's a, a constant battle that he's undergoing, and that I know that we could say that we undergo. And ultimately, though, if we look at, you know, why do we suffer? We'll get there in a second, but there is a goal in mind that Paul states in Ephesians 4, verse 13. He says, the goal is that we continue to grow, we continue to mature in Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God desires that that process continue until Christ is fully formed in us. You know, that process is one that begins with a seed. You know, if we look back to one of the parables Christ tells, he uses the example of a mustard seed. You know, it starts with a seed, but it just grows within us. If we allow that to nurture over time, if we allow the, the spirit to, to nurture that seed within us. 
But with that, of course, comes a natural struggle. And I'm sure we can all attest to that. Because while a new spiritual creature is, is conceived as, you know, it's growing and advancing within us, the flesh has to be stripped away. Again, that goes back to the battle that Paul is talking about in Romans 7. You know, the body, even though we have a new mind, even though we are being transformed, the body is still under the curse of sin. It still naturally responds to the spirit of the world as opposed to the spirit of, of Christ. And so, if we were to sum up then what Paul is talking about, he's basically saying that there's two things that should happen to those who are born again of the Spirit of Christ. Two very basic things. One, you should mature spiritually. And two, you should put the flesh to death. Those are, those are essentially, if you break it, boil it down to mature spiritually, put the flesh to death. John sums it up very nicely in John chapter 3, verse 30. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. You know, it all boils down to that. We need to become more and more like him, and less and less like us, essentially. Paul expresses that kind of twofold uh, process in, in this manner. If we go to Galatians chapter 5, I'll read verses 24 and 25. He says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So Christians are called to live by and walk in the Spirit. We're called to, to crucify the flesh. I think we can see the imagery there of taking up our cross and following Christ. It's this process of crucifying the flesh. So that's where Again, that's where the cross enters the lives of those who are disciples of Christ. And as we talked about in, in week one of this series, that's the only invitation that Christ ever gives. He only ever gives the invitation to be a disciple, which means he gives the invitation to each and every one of us to essentially crucify the flesh, that we should be maturing spiritually while the flesh is being put to death throughout the course of our lives. But that does lead to, I think, probably a fairly harsh reality as we, as we think about that and, and, and what that means. And that is simply that it would be, in my opinion, feel free to disagree, but I think that it would be difficult for any Christian to determine the best way to accomplish that twofold goal. All right, if, if the goal is to mature spiritually and to put the flesh to death, if we need to come up with that plan on our own, I think that would be a bit of a challenge. You know, I think we'd probably struggle in that. Because for one, we're often blinded by the presence of sin in our own lives, so we can't put to death what we don't per even perceive. So that's one issue. And I think just generally speaking, we don't really know the best way to actually advance Christ's life within us. It's one thing to say, okay, I need to grow in Christ, but you know, what's the... Uh, What's the checklist of things that I need to, to do to accomplish that? And while Scripture is certainly a guide for us, we still need to understand what is, what is this process. And I think, you know, if we kind of imagine for a moment, you know, you begin your, begin your life with Christ. And then God asks you to design a path that promotes spiritual growth and puts your flesh, your just natural tendencies to death. Like if that's step one of Christianity, uh, I know for a fact we'd all come up with different, uh, different versions of that, and I'm pretty sure we'd all tend towards some sort of prosperity gospel as our preferred method of spiritual growth. That's just human nature. So if God asked us to, to do that, that's where we would go. Um, and I think that it's reasonable that it's not fair for God to actually ask that of us, to, to figure out, you know, basically... You're a new creation now, figure it out. And he doesn't ask that of us. He, he doesn't put that kind of responsibility on us. As I think, again, the reality is that God alone knows the experiences, the circumstances, the, uh, the trials that each of us need that's going to provide the, you know, just that optimum, optimum environment for us to actually grow 
as children of God. So there is no you know, universal checklist that's going to apply to each and every one of us. Because each and every one of us has different strengths, different weaknesses, different struggles. That's going to be different for each one of us. And so only God knows those things that we need to go through, those things that we need to grow in. So that's why he requires everyone who comes to Christ to be prepared to surrender their lives, to be led of his spirit wherever, wherever he would direct. Right? That's why we're called to surrender to him. Because he knows those experiences, those circumstances he needs to put you in, to give you an opportunity to grow. Right? We think we've talked about before, if, if you need patience, it doesn't just sprinkle some patience dust on you and now you're patient. It's going to give you opportunities in which you can respond with patience. And probably your natural response is to not respond that way. But if that's an area you need to grow in, God will give you opportunities to grow in that. You know, if you are a prideful person, God will put you in positions to need to go the path of humility and not have those times where your pride needs to stir up within you. You know, those are a couple of, just a couple of examples of if, if those are things you struggle with, I don't just think you come to Christ and now you don't struggle with those things anymore. Now you have the Spirit within you to guide you into those things and give you a path out. A deliverance gives you the strength with which, okay, I can handle this. Uh, and over time, I can be, the way that I would respond is not the way that I will respond as I continue to grow and mature in Christ. So again, that comes back to Christ's initial invitation. It's come, take up your cross, and follow me. You know, surrender your lives, adhere to my direction. So that's going to lead into, I'm going to try to wrap this up and conclude this tonight. You know, if we, if we perceive the actual goal of salvation, those things that we've talked about tonight, which is ultimately to deliver us from sin's rule over our lives, then I think you can begin to understand the necessity of God leading all Christians down an afflicted path. I think that's the natural response that if, if we are to become more like Christ, that doesn't happen by just having always this a cushy life. Or I have a temper and therefore when I'm responded, put in situations where I can respond with anger, it's just to default to that. It's to be given opportunities to respond differently in those situations. And sometimes those, that suffering, as we see with Paul, sometimes those things are hardships he goes through as he is dealing with the religious establishment. Sometimes it's actual persecution. Sometimes it's hardships and going through shipwrecks. I mean, there's various forms of suffering. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate end, is to become more and more like Christ. And that is where it's going to become different for each and every one of us. And we'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. But I think in the end, you know, although Christ says he has purchased this deliverance from sin's bondage, you know, again, that's what the blood of Christ does. The end goal is that even though that, that has been purchased, it still needs to be manifested in our lives. You know, it's one thing to be offered a gift. It's another thing to make it your own possession. Right, if I could use, you know, for me, if someone gives me a guitar, gives that to me as a gift, I now own a guitar. But unless I learn how to actually play it and begin to master that art, then it's ultimately of no real value to me. I have the guitar still, but it's a process of actually making that my own possession of actually maturing in, in that ability to play the guitar. So there's a difference between just having something and actually being, as we talked about on Thursday night with reference to prayer, it's one thing to be able to just do something. It's another thing to be able to master that. 
and just have that, that be kind of your default, that if I pick up a guitar, is I don't need to refer to my chord charts, I don't need to refer to, like, I just be able to pick up, I can play it. You know, I just pick it up and it just kind of flows out of you. I'm sure we've all seen the context of musicians. We've all seen the musicians that they can get up, they can play anything, it's just, it's, it's almost a spiritual experience, they're just so talented. And then you see those that you just want to walk it up and walk out of the room. But for them, that's their passion. Right? That's their passion in life. They love music so much that they're going to pour everything they are into that. And you see the results of that as they grow in that. And I think there's a similar picture with each and every one of us in our own salvation. You know, we're told to work out our salvation. I think that's, that, again, that process of maturity. It's that process of wanting that, of, of having a passion for that more than anything else, that we're going to invest all of our time, all of our energy into wanting to become more and more like Christ. You know, with that new spiritual creation we are, with that spirit working within us, that becomes possible. You know, before I have the guitar, I can play air guitar all day long if I want. Uh, I'm not going to get any better as a guitarist. So it is that spirit, in this case, I guess, I guess I'm referencing the spirit being a guitar. That's very inappropriate, probably. Um, but hopefully you get the picture behind it. But in wrapping that up, I want to read a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So I think the picture here is that even though Christ has, again, even though Christ has redeemed us from the power of sin in our lives, we still need to engage in that spiritual warfare in order to put every enemy under our feet, in order to overcome that. And so Paul clearly explains the purpose of afflictions and suffering in the lives of Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. And we read this last week, but I want to read it again in this context. Paul says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so Paul keeps saying the same thing over and over again, that having the cross, the blood of Christ applied to our lives, isn't simply just to get out of hell. It isn't just simply to identify with his death but it's to actually have that lead to life. It's to have that life of Christ within us to grow in that. It's so that life of Christ may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, I think we'd all agree that the life of Christ will one day be manifested in our immortal flesh. But Paul doesn't say that here. He says that the life of Christ may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That the life of Christ may be manifested in us while we're here on this earth. That is the path that we're called to walk as Christians. That is the afflicted path that we're called to walk. And that requires suffering. You know, that requires those things within us that needs to be, to be purged out. I mean, I think of the example of, uh, of Micah, of the refiner's fire. Right? Being in a fire, I can imagine, wouldn't be a pleasant experience. But the image there is that these precious metals with their imperfections, they needed to go under the fire first to have all of those impurities stripped away. The end product is that once those impurities are gone, you have this precious metal that God knows that it's done when he can see his reflection in that metal. That's how you know a, a precious metal is done. It's, it reflects. And so I think that's that process for us is that those imperfections in us, those things that we need to remove from our lives, God is putting us in the fire, so to speak. He's allowing us go, to go through those sufferings so that when he looks at us, he sees his own image, that we were reflecting his image back to him. And so that, I believe, is why we're re required to have suffering. You know, we're required to purge those things from our lives that don't reflect Christ. And as much as we need the cross of Christ to begin that journey, if we don't allow the Spirit to work out those things, if we don't follow His leading, we'll never allow those things to be put to death within us. 